um, the labeling portion to our class here uh, for chapter one. So we'll just pull that up right there, minimize that. Send it over there. Okay. So let us finish up here with the chapter one introduction material. And we were on the small intestine last time. And we talked about that there's three parts to the small intestine, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the distal portion or terminal portion called the ileum. I-L-E-U-M, ileum. So you can see the ileum right here in our little model here. It's, this, it's pretty much this last portion of the small intestine there. So on this model here, you can see um, there, the structure that's, in, that's being labeled here is the pancreas. A couple things to point out to you in regards to the position of the pancreas. The pancreas sits between the duodenum, the small intestine here, the spleen, okay, and then it's inferior to the stomach, while it's also superior to the transverse portion. We'll talk about this in a second, the transverse colon. This is that part of the colon, the large intestine that goes from the left to the right or the right to the left. And so it sits right here, it's right in the middle there. So you can see here on this model in a little bit more of a detail, you can see here's the uh, duodenum, the small intestine, and then the pancreas is right over here. And both the kidneys sit all right behind the pancreas there. All right, speaking of the spleen, it's the largest lymphatic organ in the body, and it sits here at the end of the pancreas on the left side of your body. So the spleen is in the upper left hand quadrant. Let me show you another picture to kind of give you a better um, reference to where the, the spleen sits. And you can see we've taken out the liver and we've taken out the pancreas and the stomach and left the spleen behind right over here. Okay, let's get into the large intestine, <clears throat> okay? So after the small intestine kind of dumps the, the chyme, which is what we call the food product, mixed up with all the digestive uh, um, uh, secretions and whatnot, it empties here into this sac-like structure called the cecum, okay? So the cecum is almost kind of all like a blind sac here. And you can see it on this model over here. So the ileum dumps out its food product here into the cecum. And there's a structure that hangs off the cecum and that's the appendix, also known as the vermiform appendix. You can see it here on this model. It just kind of hangs down. Now, unfortunately, from time to time, um, uh, the appendix can rupture or it can get a really bad infection and uh, one needs to have that removed as soon as possible. But other than that, the appendix really does not serve uh, any uh, function that we are aware of as of right now. It's thought that it used to, but right now, we don't believe that it serves any useful function. So from the cecum, we're gonna move superiorly up towards the head. And so that part of the colon that ascends or goes upward, that's known as the ascending colon. So it's gonna go from the cecum to this curve here. This is on the right side of your body. Here it is on this model. And that's the ascending colon. And so the ascending colon comes to a bend or a turn, and we call that the hepatic flexure or the right colic flexure. Either or is acceptable. Hepatic comes from the liver. So the hepatic flexure is going to be on the same side as the liver. It's going to be on the right side there. Here you can see it on this model here. So right colic flexure or the hepatic flexure. All right, so now the colon, the large intestine is gonna go from the right side of your body over to the left. And that part of your large intestine we call the transverse colon. So it crosses the midline of your body, goes from the right side of your body over to the left side of your body. 
And then it's going to encounter another bend or another term. And so we call that term the splenic flexure or the left colic flexure. Splenic flexure or left colic flexure. All right, and we call it the splenic flexure because you can see right here, there's the spleen. So it's very proximal to the spleen, or so, excuse me, it's in the proximity of the spleen. So once again, after this turn, the colon is going to uh, move downwards. Yes, I will. I will take either one of those answers on the test. Absolutely. So now we're on the left side of the body. So the colon will start to descend towards the feet. So we give that a name and we call that the descending colon on the left side of your body. <clears throat> and so the colon is going to start to enter into the pelvic cavity. Here you can see the descending colon. And so now we're getting to the end here. We're getting really close to the distal or the terminal end of your digestive tract. So we've got to find the exit. So the colon is actually going to move in. It's going to continue to go inferiorly, but it's going to move posteriorly. It's going to go back right towards the center portion of your pelvis. And so it makes a kind of a, these two turns that look like an S. And we call that part, all right, of the, of the large intestine, the sigmoid colon, because it does kind of resemble an S a little bit. And so the sigmoid colon is going to then finish up right, and terminate at the last part of, of the large intestine. And this is the area in which we're going to store your feces right, while we're waiting to expel it from your body, and that's the rectum. <clears throat> so you can see this region here is the rectum, and that's pretty much where your feces will start to collect and collect until it's time for defecation. <clears throat> so this here is the first time we've seen a model like this. Um, this is one of our sagittal cut models. So we've kind of, uh, so we can have a look at the internal structures here. And so just to kind of give you a little bit of a point of reference here, okay, this is the anterior part. And then back here is the posterior part. So you can see here's the spine. Here's your spinal cord right here. And so we can see just in front of the spine is the rectum. Here's your tailbone, also known as, it's known as the coccyx. So the rectum sits all the way in the posterior portion here. This is a female model, okay? Because we can see that there's a uterus here, some fallopian tubes and an ovary. All right, and then we also see anterior to the uterus, the urinary bladder here. All right, but we don't see any external genitalia or any internal genitalia resembling a male model. So this is a female model. So you need to know the relationship between these three structures. Urinary bladder is anterior, okay? The rectum is posterior and in between both are going to be the uterus. So here you can see we're at a male model. Um, aside from the ex obvious external genitalia here, you can see at the base of the urinary bladder is the prostate gland. But you can see behind or posterior to both the prostate gland and the urinary bladder, here's the rectum. And there's a close proximity between the prostate gland and the rectum. And that's why for uh, males, when they reach a certain age, they have to undergo a digital uh, examination. And so uh, the anus and the rectum are the best ways to uh, examine the prostate gland. And so you can see here from kind of like a posterior uh, lateral view, right, here's the rectum posteriorly to the urinary bladder and the prostate gland. And then one more for good luck showing us the rectum right, on this model and then the urinary bladder anterior to that. And then the final portion of the digestive tract is the anus. That's the exit, okay? So when it's time for defecation, the, the sphincter muscles of the anus will relax, and then the smooth muscles inside the rectum will contract, 
and it will push out um, the contents of the rectum, the fecal matter, matter there. <clears throat> and here you can see finally, again, the anus at the terminal portion of the digestive system there. All right, enough with the digestive tract. Let's talk about some other systems. You're gonna go into more detail about this stuff when you get into these specific chapters, like chapter 26 for the digestive tract. I think chapter 24 is the urinary tract, which is going to include the kidneys. So let's talk about the kidneys. There are these two bean-shaped organs, okay? They serve several functions. One of fun their major functions is to filter out the blood, okay? So again, we're looking at this model, right? This kidney is on our, our right side, but it's going to be on the anatomical left side. You do need to identify it as either the left or right kidney. So obviously this is the left kidney. <clears throat> Here you can see on this model, again, this model is facing us. So the right side of the page is actually going to be the anatomical left side. And you notice there's a yellow tube leaving the kidney going down into this structure here. That's the urinary bladder. Remember what I said, blue tubes and red tubes are blood vessels. This is a yellow tube. You know what else is yellow? Pee pee, urine. So that's what's being generated here. Okay. The kidneys are, are making the urine. The urine travels down um, into the ureter. It drains the kidney and goes into the urinary bladder there. Here's our model. You can see we're on the left side of our screen, but this is the model's right side. That is the right kidney. It does look like a kidney bean. It's funny that you say that. That's what I always think. And if you notice that the right kidney is lower than the left kidney, and the reason for that is it's because the liver, it's not there, but it sits right above that right kidney and it pushes it down. Same thought, great minds think alike. All right, and then we can see here on this model, right, it is uh, um, on the right side of this model. And you can see here's the right kidney again draining. There's the right ureter draining down here into the urinary bladder. Now on top of each of the kidneys, we have a gland. <clears throat> in chapter 17, you'll be fortunate enough to talk about that in detail. All right, but for right now, uh, we're gonna name these glands. These are, are the adrenal glands and they make several types of hormones. Random fact, kidney beans are poisonous when raw. Is that really true? Well, I'll be darned. I don't really eat kidney beans all that much. But all right, now I'm going to be very, very suspect. <laughs> and and uh, I'm about to be very careful about that. I'm assuming it's probably in large quantities that they're poisonous when raw. I'm, I think... Can't imagine. I'm sure somebody's eaten a kidney bean before raw and not died. I could be wrong though. Google, yeah, I know. I'll have to Google it. Google knows. All right. So if you look, that adrenal gland looks kind of like a glob, and we haven't really uh, discussed uh, fatty tissue, but it does look like fat. And it has to do with uh, because there is a lot of cholesterol in there. All right. There's the left ureter. ureter as it's draining the left kidney. And you can see it now in this model. Now, again, it doesn't look yellow, all right? But again, we see the color of this looks tan. So it doesn't fit our blood vessel description because it's not red, it's not blue, right? So we know it's not a blood vessel, but we do notice, okay, that it is um, going from the kidney down to the urinary bladder. So therefore, it is the left ureter. And then there's the right ureter, draining the right kidney into the urinary bladder on that model. And then again, we can see on this model, on the right side of the body, again, it's exiting the right kidney and draining down into the urinary bladder there. You can see the uh, left adrenal gland. One thing, you can also call that gland the suprarenal gland. Supra is above. Okay, but I mean, adrenal is much shorter, easier to remember. So most of the times I refer to it as the adrenal gland. So this is the right adrenal gland, or it's also known as the right suprarenal gland. 
more letters, more typing, more chances of misspelling. I, I don't want that, at least for me. And here you can see the urinary bladder where the urine drains into, it's stored there until you get the urge to actually urinate. And then uh, the urine will leave the urinary bladder through the urethra. Here you can see the urinary bladder deep into the pelvic cavity, it's way down there. Here's the lateral view. Again, there's a couple other structures in the proximity of the urinary bladder. Immediately posterior to that is the uterus, all right? And then uh, posterior to that, to the uterus is the rectum. Please, it's, I see it happen often. Um, folks will confuse the urinary bladder with the uterus and vice versa. Urinary bladder is in front, okay? <clears throat> Easy to remember, pee comes out the front, Baby comes out the middle, poop leaves out the back. Someone told me that once. If it helps you, it helps you. It does stretch. And actually, and we're gonna learn a little bit about the type of uh, tissue that lines the bladder, but yes, the urinary bladder can stretch and it can hold a significant amount uh, uh, of urine up to about 500 milliliters, which is a decent amount, okay? Um, it's made for that, much like the stomach is made to stretch. You saw the rugae on the inside of the stomach. Well, the urinary bladder has rugae on, on the inside of it. Here's the uterus again, right here in the middle. We're, go, we're now moving to a different system, okay? Now dealing with the uh, reproductive system. So here you can see on the sagittal view the, where the uterus is, <clears throat> all right? And then now we're, we're looking at the uterus here. And this model, it's this whole structure right here. And then inferior to the uterus or the canal that's leading into the uterus, there's the vagina. <clears throat> All right. And here you can see the uterus on this model here. We haven't cut into it. We'll talk about the other structures coming off the side. One slide at a time, please. Okay, so again, back into the internal portion of our model here, you can see kind of, I think it looks kind of pink or I don't know what color you'd kind of describe that as, all right, or peach type of color. But this structure allows the egg to enter into the uterus. We call this structure, this tube-like structure, the fallopian tube, or you can call it the uterine tube. And we're gonna learn about the type of tissue that lines the inside of the tube. So here you can see on this model, the fallopian tube here, again, this structure right, is where the, the oocytes or the egg will travel down this tube and it'll enter here into the uterus, hopefully get fertilized, and then hopefully implantation will occur so that the uh, fetus can start to develop. And here's one more picture of the fallopian tube. And you can see, okay, the distal portion of the fallopian tube kind of covers part of the ovary here, because that's what this structure is. So the eggs reside here. An egg will be expelled during ovulation and it'll enter into the fallopian or uterine tube there. <clears throat> So there you can see the ovary, it's a small kind of walnut shaped uh, uh, size structure. <clears throat> okay, and the, you can see how the fallopian tubes kind of wrapped around it a little bit. And that's where the eggs or the oocytes um, will be. And there's quite a lot of them in there. What's the different white spots in the ovary? That's a great question. Um, what that is showing you is the different developmental stages of the follicle. So think of it like this. You are the egg in your apartment or your house. In the house of the, or your apartment, all right, or, or the room that you're in is going to be the follicle. All right, and that's what holds the egg. And then... The whole and the house is the ovary. So 
you have all these rooms in the house, right? You have all these eggs in the ovary and the eggs or the oocytes live inside the follicles and the follicles help with the development. So this picture is showing you the different stages of development. There's a much better picture um, and you'll go over that when you get into the reproductive tract there. Like a process, that's right, very good. Yeah, exactly, Rachel, that is a, it is a process and it will show you, all right, um, we have much better models that are much bigger that will show you what will happen at a certain, what's going on during the whole menstrual uh, process, that 28 day cycle, um, the follicle goes through several changes as does the egg and the oocytes. Um, so that's just, that's what, that's what we're representing. Okay, so on to the male genitalia here. All right, external genitalia, there's the penis on this uh, um, sagittal cut, okay? It is one of two of the external genitalia on the male here, all right? On this model, and I know that some people have a tendency to do this because of where the arrow is pointing, all right? For this class, you just need to be, be able to identify the penis. You don't have to identify the different parts. Some people will write in their shaft of the penis, and that's fine. You're not really wrong, and I won't mark you wrong if you're to do that, right? But you'll learn that um, when you do the reproductive track. But if you want to put it in, you're, it's fine, but I'm just saying you don't have to. And then you can see here on this uh, sagittal cut here, um, also the arrows pointing to the penis. <clears throat> okay, posterior to the penis on this model, you can see uh, one of the primary reproductive organs on the male, and that's the testi. The testi is external to the body. Okay, so that ball-like structure that you're seeing there, that is the testi. And then you can see on this model here, it's covered with these blood vessels here. Is that spelled correctly? Yes, I mean, now I know that some of you have probably heard testicle, okay? Um, you wouldn't be wrong. All right. I don't want to split hairs, but um, that term's not really used to, uh, uh, too, too much uh, in, in our class. Testes is going to be plural for testis. I'm not going to split hairs on that. If you were to write testes on there, again, I mean, grammatically, you'd be wrong, but I wouldn't, you know. <clears throat> You don't have to be specific and you don't have to be specific as to which one's the right one and which one's the left one. Make it a little bit easier on you. And here again, posterior to the penis on this model, you can see there's the testing on this model here. And it actually sits inside the scrotum, okay? And the reason why the testes uh, are outside the body is because they need a cooler temperature. Body temperature is too warm. Sperm don't like that. Okay. Here is the urinary bladder. Just inferior to the urinary bladder is this structure called the prostate gland. It sits at the base and part of the urethra, which is the tube that exits the urinary bladder and goes all the way through to the outside world through the penis. But part of it goes through the prostate gland. You can see it sits here. Keep in mind, the prostate gland on the male is inferior to the urinary bladder. You can see it better here, okay? So it's inferior to the urinary bladder. It's anterior to the rectum. And then here again, you can see it on this model. Okay, so there's a ridge-like structure that sits on top of each testy. All right, so this, the arrow is pointing to this, it's a ridge-like structure. It actually looks kind of like a comma. So we just laid the comma on top of the testy here. And this is, it's called the epididymis. The epididymis is where the sperm go to grow up. It's like boarding school. They get sent, sent off there, they go to mature, and they grow up. And that's this ridge-like structure. Please, please don't write testy. The testy's down here. Okay, that's the epididymis right there. So, <clears throat> When the sperm um, are, are developing and it's time for the ejaculation for them to leave the body, okay, uh, we are going to transport the sperm from the scrotum to the inside or internal portion of the body. So the tube that connects the testes, and this tube goes all the way back towards the prostate gland, that's called the ductus deferens or the vas deferens. 
For orchids that have two names, will there be a certain name you want or do you want both? No, you give me one name. Any of the names that you see on these slides are correct. They're also in your lab manual. So if you want to know, okay, if you want to know um, where they're at, okay, like how to spell it correctly, just look in the lab manual. That's the uh, thing that you bought at the uh, bookstore. That's like five or seven bucks and it's got all these terms inside. That's, it'll have all that information in there. So this tube here is called the ductus deferens or the vas deferens. And so you can see once it comes in through the spermatic cord, it enters in and it runs along the lateral or the side of the urinary bladder and then it's gonna duck back here, right? And it's gonna to head towards the prostate gland. <clears throat> okay, and that's the end of that. We already saw all these, all right, the cavity. So again, that's on another uh, slideshow. Just kind of review some of that because you can see some of these pictures. I can almost guarantee you're either going to see one of these two pictures or this picture on the test. So you want to know all right, your serous membranes, the names of these um, cavities and the names of the serous membrane, all right, that lines the organ and the cavity there. All right. Discard. Okay. So we're done with chapter one. I want to start off chapter five. That's tissues. Okay, and um, tissues is not, one of the things I should say for this course, lecture and lab will not, they're gonna diverge a little bit, okay? Whereas right now we're in lecture, we were studying chapter two, but in lab, we're gonna start studying chapter five. So you're gonna see some brand new material that we haven't seen yet. All right, we'll meet back up uh, in several weeks when lecture and lab will be back together again. So whatever we're covering in lecture, we'll see, you know, we'll be covering the anatomy of that in lab and, and, and whatnot. But for right now, just bear with me, be patient. It's going to be what lecture and lab are. Yeah, they're from the same book, absolutely. It's just that some of the uh, lecture material is a little bit slower going and some of the lab material, um, we can move through at a little bit of a quicker pace. So it, it'll diverge a little bit, but we'll, we'll meet back up, okay? So that's why I'm gonna kind of lay some of the basic foundation work for you. Um, oh, you will, trust me. Cause you, know, you will get it, you'll own it. <clears throat> Just listen to what I have to say and text me questions, or not text me questions, but email me questions. If you're not quite sure, look at the, uh, the schedule too, and it'll kind of um, guide you through where we're gonna be and what we're gonna be doing. Um, <clears throat> All right, let's close the lab atlas here because now we're going to talk about <clears throat> tissues. So as we move through our levels of organization, okay, I said today, we started off in lecture at the simplest level, atoms and molecules, okay? And then that progresses to macromolecules like proteins, carbohydrates, fats. And then we're gonna learn about organelles, which are these small, really, really tiny structures that live inside of our cells that are kind of like the organs of the cell. And then we're gonna learn about the cell. That's chapter four. We're gonna get into cytology. Chapter five, then we get into histology. That's the study of tissues. So we gotta know what a tissue is. Real easy, okay? real easy when we're talking about what a tissue is. It is a group of similar cells. And then the stuff outside of the cells, what we call extracellular material, all right, that perform a common function. That function could be absorption, secretion, filtration, protection, all right? But the fact of the matter is, is that these tissues are, we just took a whole bunch of cells, they're, they're, the, they're the same, they're similar to one another, okay? And then we have some other uh, 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 
components, what we call extracellular material on the outside of these cells. And we'll get into that. And they all form a common goal, a common function. So we're going to talk about that. I need to encourage you to memorize this right now or as soon as possible. There's four types of tissues. I ask everybody this question all of the time, all of the time, okay? My son even knows this. And he told me this when he was in seventh grade. And so you will need to know this throughout this course and throughout 211. So there's four tissue types, epithelial tissue, which we're gonna to cover today, connective tissue, and then I'm sure the last two you probably have heard at least once or twice before. Then there's muscle tissue and nervous tissue, okay? So we're gonna learn about, you know, what these tissues look like and what they do, all right? Because it's very important for us to understand that when we're talking about the different types of tissue. So let's start off with the very first type of tissue, which is epithelial tissue, all right? Epithelial tissue, right? I'm gonna teach you how we name or classify epithelial tissue. And there's two things that we need to do to name this tissue. The first thing we need to do is, all right, we need to find out how many layers of cells there are. And then the second thing we need to do is we need to know the shape of the cells. So let's talk about the first one. Okay, so we're gonna classify our epithelial tissue all right, the first component is the number of cell layers. And I'm gonna make it real easy on you, real, real easy. If it is only one cell layer thick, we call it simple epithelium. If there's two or more, then it's stratified. Strata means layers. That's simple, okay? So put, put that into your, in your brain right now, into your brain pan. One cell layer, it's simple epithelium. If it's two or three or four or more, it's called stratified. All right, so simple epithelium, let's go back. Simple epithelium, all, well, I shouldn't say simple epithelium. All epithelium sits on top of, all right, this structure called the basement membrane. That's that extracellular material that I was talking to you about on the previous slide. Okay, so when we talk about simple epithelium, since there's only one cell layer, then all the cells of that epithelium sit on top of the basement membrane. So this type of epithelium it is wonderful for filtering things because it's a very thin layer. It's also good for absorption, like in your digestive tract. And it's wonderful for secretion, like our glands, okay? So those are the functions for simple epithelium, filtration, absorption, secretion. Stratified epithelium is a little bit different, okay? So since it's two or more layers of cells, the basal layer, Dr. Koss, what does basal mean? Basal means bottom, easy to remember. They both begin with B, basal, bottom. All right, good so far, I hope. Okay. I'm gonna ask everybody to check their mics. I'm getting some feedback there. So just make sure that your mics are off. I would love for, that, for them to be all on, we could talk, but unfortunately it's tough to do and we get feedback. Okay, so the bottom layer, all right, of stratified epithelium is called the basal layer and it makes contact with the basement membrane. The top layer does not, all right? So we're gonna see this type of epithelium in areas that undergo a lot of mechanical stress. A lot of, like in your cheeks, your mouth, okay? Uh, the anus, the vagina, all right? You're going to see all right, this epithelium, because think about it, we want to have lots of layers of cells, right, in areas that you undergo a lot of mechanical stress so you, we don't damage the underlying tissues. And then, of course, we got this weirdo here, this very strange type of epithelium. 
It's called pseudo stratified. Pseudo means falsely or false. So it looks like it's stratified, okay? So it looks like it has several layers, but it does not, okay? It's only one layer, but here's the thing. <clears throat> all of the cells, all of them are going to make contact with the basement membrane, but not all of them will reach the apical surface. What's the apical surface? That's the top, okay? Like the apex of a mountain, that's the top of the mountain. The apical surface is the top layer of the tissue. So let me show you on this slide, disregard this over here. Don't pay attention to this right now. Pay attention to the stuff on the left side of the slide. All right, so this is simple epithelium. And you can see it's one cell layer thick. Here's the basement membrane. All of the cells sit on top of that. That's our extracellular material, okay? You can see the bottom portion of the cell is called the basal surface. The top portion of the cell is called the apical surface. That's the top, this is the bottom. So that's easy, right? Simple epithelium. Now we go down to stratified epithelium. You can see it's multiple layers. Okay, but only the bottommost layer here contacts the basement membrane. Only the bottom layer. So we call that the basal layer. And then you can see here at the top, okay, that's the apical surface. One thing I want to draw to your attention, when we are naming, actually, I'll come back to that because I want to um, finish how we name uh, epithelium. Okay, so remember what I told you. There's two things that we have to do to classify epithelium. One, we have to figure out how many layers there are. And then the second one is we have to look at the shapes of the cells in this tissue. So there's three shapes that you need to know. Okay, the first shape is squamous. It's a flat cell. And the nucleus, which is the control center of the cell, is also flat. So to me, it looks like a fried egg. Okay, I've also heard it described as it's got a tile, tile-like feature. Okay, but to me, it looks like a flat egg or, or, or a fried egg. All right, so it's flattened. Then the next type of cell shape is called cuboidal. And cuboidal cells are as tall as they are wide. So that means they're pretty much like a square or a cube. And at the center of these cells are going to be the uh, nuclei and the nuclei are nice and spherical, nice and rounded, a squished avocado. That's exactly right. And I love avocados. Actually, I'm growing an avocado tree um, on my front porch right now. Fingers crossed, hopefully it'll produce uh, avocados. If they do, Look out, Tom Selleck. You probably don't know this, but Tom Selleck, he used to be the old Magnum PI. Oh, you're allergic? Sorry to hear that. Mm, sorry to hear that. Um, Tom Selleck owns the largest avocado farm in the United States, somewhere in California. Because <clears throat> mm, I love guacamole. I used to not eat guacamole because it was green. That's pretty juvenile. Okay, cuboidal cells. So that's the cuboidal cell. Then finally, the last type of cell, we call them columnar cells. And so they're taller than they are wide, except their nucleus sits at the bottom of the cell, the basal part of the cell. And the nucleus looks like an egg. It's, it's oval shaped. <clears throat> I'll show you the better pictures on the next slide. And then the last type of epithelial uh, cell shape I call this the transformer epithelium. Transitional epithelium, these cells have the ability to change shape and it depends on what's going on to the cells. We'll find this type of epithelium in the urinary bladder. So depending on how much stretch is going on in the urinary bladder um, is depending on how much uh, urine is in the bladder. So the more urine that's in the bladder, the more stretch that goes on, it'll change the shape of these cells. We'll talk about that, okay? But they're the transformer cells. They change shape. Okay, you can see here now the different shapes 
all right, for those uh, um, uh, epithelial cells. Here's the squamous cell, nice and flat, cuboidal, square-like. Okay, you have the nucleus nice and spherical in the center, and then you've got your columnar cell. It's taller than it is wide, and you have the nice oval-shaped nucleus towards the bottom of the cell. So now you folks know how to classify epithelium. Okay, what I'm about to tell you is very important. I was gonna tell you earlier, but then I wanted to stop myself and come back here. When we are naming stratified epithelium, you notice on the slide here, the cells down here at the bottom, okay, those look like, these look cuboidal, and these almost look like they're what we call low columnar, but yet the, the cells on the top look squamous. So it looks like all three shapes of cells are in this sample. So we have a solution to that problem, because how do I know, should I call that stratified squamous epithelium, stratified cuboidal epithelium, stratified columnar? We've got a solution to that. Whatever the cells look like on the apical surface towards the top here is what you name stratified epithelium after. So since they're squamous, this would be stratified squamous epithelium. <laughs> Frog eggs. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, so keep that in mind now. Whatever the cells look like at the apical surface, at the very tip top, that's the cell shape that we are going to utilize in the naming or classification of our epithelium. Okay, so you'll see this figure here in chapter five, and it's a nice little table, uh, well, not a table, excuse me, a chart showing, all right, a simplified way to move through the different types of epithelium. We're gonna go through all this today, okay? And then, and then we'll, we'll stop. <clears throat> it seems like a lot, but trust me, I'll work through it real fast. Okay, so when we're dealing with the types of epithelium, we break it down to two types. Either it's simple epithelium or it's stratified epithelium. And then we get down to the more specific, depending on the shape of the cells, we have simple squamous, simple cuboidal, simple columnar and pseudostratified columnar. That's that type of epithelium that looks like it has a lot of layers, but it's only one layer. And then the other type here, we got the stratified epithelium, which has two or more layers. And then of course, when we throw in the cell shapes, stratified squamous, stratified cuboidal, stratified columnar, transitional. And then there's some subcategories under these individual ones. And so we'll talk about it. Like, for example, stratified squamous has keratinized and non-keratinized. We'll talk more about the keratinized in chapter six, because that's going to be with skin. And pretty much most, if you look down at your skin, you're looking at keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. That means all the cells are dead. Okay, we're going to talk more about non-keratinized in chapter five. All right, so now let's get into the details. Now you're gonna find out as we move through some of this stuff, all right, you're gonna see, hey, it's not as difficult now that I know how to name these cells here. Off topic question, you don't have to answer till the end of the lesson, but. Okay, yeah, do me a favor, Rachel. Ask me when I'm done and I'll, and, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do that, okay? Don't let me forget, okay, please. Okay. So let's start off with simple squamous. Now looking at the name, you can see it, all right? You can figure out what this epithelium is going to look like just from the name. So it's simple, which means it's one cell layer and it's squamous, so that means the cells are flat. And so what did we say about simple epithelium, all right? Because it's one layer thin, it's going to be a thin barrier, which is great for filtration, absorption, and secretion. So you're gonna find this type of epithelium in areas in which we want certain molecules or atoms or gases to be able to move quickly, all right, across the surface of this epithelium. 
So we're going to see it in the lungs. Remember, we talked about the alveoli. Those are the air sacs. We're also going to see it in vessel walls. That includes lymphatic vessels, but I'm thinking more blood vessels, like in the capillaries. Okay, the capillaries are the smallest blood vessel or, or sized blood vessel in the body, and they're so small and thin, that's where the gases from our blood can go into the tissues, and the, and the gases from the tissues can go into the blood. That's where we'll see a lot of that exchange, okay? And then we already talked about serous membranes. That was last class. Okay, we talked about the parietal and visceral layers of the serous membranes. And those are those layers are just one cell layer thick. They're very, very thin. All righty. So that's the first type of epithelium. So simple squamous epithelium. The next type is simple cuboidal. So again, simple tells us that there's one layer. Cuboidal tells us what they look like. They're square, so they're gonna be as tall as they are wide. And we know where the nucleus is gonna be. It's gonna be right in the middle. And you can see, look at these pictures here. I mean, look at these nice rounded nuclei. They look awesome. All right, so you can see that, it's quite obvious, <laughs> okay? So, simple epithelium, absorption, secretion, filtration. So keep in mind in this type, if you see absorption and secretion is one of the functions for epithelium, when you see secretion, you're thinking glands, sweat glands, all right, exocrine glands, endocrine glands. We haven't learned those. We will later on, okay? So I want you to think when you see a function of epithelium and it says secretion, you should be thinking glands, all right? They're wonderful. This epithelium we're going to see, all right, when we're talking about absorption, well, guess where we see absorption? We're going to see a lot of absorption in the kidneys. Remember, I told you the kidneys filter the blood. So we're going to absorb and, re and then excrete certain things. All right. All right, simple columnar epithelium. Again, one cell layer thick, but these cells are columnar shaped, which means they're taller than they are wide. We know where the nucleus is. It's going to be during, in the bottom portion of the cell, okay? Are the cells below the layer of the skin? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And we'll talk about that, okay? Your skin, uh, there, there's two major layers to the skin, and we'll talk about that in Chapter 6, okay? Um, uh, the outer layer is known as the epidermis, and that's all squamous cells. Those are in, in, in uh, the inner layer, okay? That's the dermis, and that's going to have not only cells in there, but that's going to have this uh, uh, all the other types of tissue in there. It's going to have nervous tissue, muscle tissue, and then we haven't learned connective tissue yet, okay? So and in that connective tissue, you can have cells. So yes, uh, there are cells below the layer of the skin, absolutely. So when we're dealing with simple columnar epithelium, all right, it also has secretory and absorption as its functions. So again, when you see secretion or, se or secretory functions, think glands, absorption, again, we're going to see, all right, this type of epithelium, a lot of it is going to be located in the digestive tract because we're dealing with absorbing the uh, contents of whatever it is that you ate. So there's two types of simple columnar epithelium. There's ciliated and non-ciliated. Cilia, here's our cell. Cilia are these hair-like projections that come off the cell. Okay, they come off the apical surface or the top surface of the cell. And so what happens is, is that they move. The cell doesn't, but the cilia does. So what the cilia do is they move back and forth. So their role is to, or their function or their job is to move things past the cell. And we're going to talk about those things, right? Mainly it's going to be mucus. And we'll get into that. So they're ciliated which has these cilia right here, these hair-like projections coming off the cell, and there's non-ciliated. 
So let's talk about the non-ciliated first. Okay, so you see the non-ciliated, that means there's no cilia, but these cells have a special structure on top of them. And that's called microvilli. And so what microvilli are, microvilli are these small, tiny projections that come off the top part or the apical surface of the cell. And they're all the same height. And basically, we'll, we'll talk about this when we get into chapter four, there's three parts to a cell. There's the plasma membrane, the nucleus, and then there's the cytoplasm. The plasma membrane is the envelope, okay? It's, it's the structure that um, is the outer portion of the cell. And so inside of the plasma membrane is the cytoplasm, that's the goo, and then the, the nucleus, which is the control center for the cell, it sits in the middle. So the plasma membrane has these special projections that come off and they're not that big. But what they are is they're an extension of the plasma membrane. And what they do is they increase the surface area of the cell. So you'll see this in areas of where we're going to be absorbing things. Well, in this type of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, in this type of epithelium, we're gonna have a special kind of cell, which is called a goblet cell. And we call it a goblet cell because it looks like a wine glass. And these goblet cells are glands. It's a single cell and they produce this component called mucin. Mucin is a glycoprotein. And what that means is it's a protein with a sugar coating on it. But the nice thing about the mucin is when it gets produced and it mixes with water, it turns into mucus. And that mucus will coat the top part of the cell. And when we're dealing with the digestive tract, that mucus helps to increase lubrication. So as that food is moving through your digestive tract, we're constantly lubricating the tube that it's going through so we're not damaging the tissue. And that mucus also helps to neutralize some of the stomach acids. Yeah, oil glands sit in that uh, layer of the skin too. Um, you have different types. You're probably thinking of the sebaceous gland. The sebaceous gland is a gland that sits in the dermis of the skin and it's made up of several uh, uh, cells. And so it produces that thick kind of oily secretion that you get. So we're gonna see non-ciliated simple columnar epithelium pretty much all the way from your stomach to the anus. So it plays a huge role in absorption. Remember, it's simple columnar, it's simple epithelium. So it's absorption is one of the, the, the functions that simple columnar undergoes. So this is going to be absorbing a lot of the nutrients that you just ate. All right, the next type of simple columnar epithelium is the ciliated simple columnar epithelium. Okay, so again, we have this long cell here, and then it's got these long hairs coming off the top. And they move back and forth. And the reason why is we need to move that mucus. Because yes, we have goblet cells inside this epithelium. So the goblet cells produce the mucin, and the mucin mixes with the water, it turns into mucus, and then the cilia need to move that mucus um, away from the cells, okay? So we'll see this in our bronchioles. The bronchioles are the pipes of your lungs. That's where the air travels down into, okay, to get down to the alveola. So you have mucus being produced there. And so the cilia help to move the mucus away from the alveoli sacs and up towards your trachea and throat, get rid of it. And also in our uterine tubes, what are those? Those are those fallopian tubes. <clears throat> Remember I was telling you the egg gets produced in the ovary and has to travel down the uterine and fallopian tube to the uterus. And the problem is the egg doesn't have a way to move. So in order to correct that problem, all right, the uterine tubes are lined with this type of epithelium 
and the cilia beat in the direction towards the uterus. So it sweeps and moves the oocyte or the egg from the ovary to the uterus. It takes about six days for that to happen, by the way. All right, and the last one in the, in the um, simple epithelium category is the pseudostratified. This is the one that looks like it has lots of layers, but it doesn't. But keep in mind, all of the cells are in direct contact with the basement membrane. But not all of them reach the top surface. So that's why it looks like it's uh, stratified. <clears throat> so there's two types, ciliated and non-ciliated. Let's talk about the ciliated first. The ciliated epithelium, again, same situation. We have cilia on the surface there. The cilia move back and forth, okay? Now it says here that it performs a protective function, in which it does, because the goblet cells produce the mucin, the mucin turns into mucus, okay? And what's the job of the mucus? To trap foreign particles. If you live in the inner city of a huge city with a lot of pollution, you're gonna be breathing in these foreign particles. Well, your respiratory tract produces all right, mucus to help trap those particles. Well, once they're trapped in the mucus, we don't want them just sitting there. You got to get rid of them. So the cilia move all right, the mucus in the direction towards your throat and mouth. Okay, it doesn't want to go the other way. It doesn't want to go towards the lungs. It wants to go away from the lungs. So we're going to see all right, this type of epithelium, yes, in the respiratory system, but mainly in the large passageways. Includes your note, your nose, excuse me, part of your throat, your larynx, which is your voice box. All right, we'll also see it in the trachea and the bronchi. Remember, the trachea splits off into the right and left primary bronchi. We're going to see that these structures are going to be um, lined with this type of epithelium, and so it produce it protects those structures. All right, and then the um, other type of, not, of pseudostratified columnar epithelium is the non-ciliated. This stuff is rare, and so I think of it being rare, it doesn't got anything good. So what I mean by that is it doesn't have any cilia, and it doesn't have any goblet cells. But it does have a protective function. So you're going to see this in the male urethra and the epididymis. All right, almost halfway done, okay, with epithelium. So now let's move on to the next type of epithelium, which is the stratified. Yes, in the cells, the nucleus is going to be inside. Now, certain cells, and I'll tell, and, and you'll get into that as the course goes on, but for right now, all right, just consider all the cells to have a nucleus, okay? There's certain exceptions to that rule, but right now, and we'll tell you those exceptions, but right now, all cells have a nucleus. <clears throat> all right, so something you need to consider when we're dealing with non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. All those cells are alive because when we're dealing with keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, all the cells are dead, okay? So, and we'll discuss that, what happens. But basically what, what um, the cell will make keratin. Keratin is a protein that helps to protect the cell and makes it tougher and stronger. But unfortunately, as it's producing that keratin, it fills up the inside of the cell, killing everything off on the inside. So yes, it makes the cell stronger, but the cell dies because of it. So I wanna make a shirt that says keratin kills. I think it'd be a great shirt. And people that, are, uh, that have taken anatomy would probably laugh when they saw it. But anyways, so we're gonna see non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium in moist areas. And because it's stratified, it's going to have a protective uh, um, function. And so it's going to be found in areas that undergo a lot of mechanical stress. All right. 
So we're gonna see it in moist areas that undergo a lot of mechanical stress. Well, your mouth, when you're chewing on stuff, part of your pharynx, which is part of your throat, the esophagus, all right? Again, because you're gonna be swallowing food and then the vagina and the anus. So think of this type of epithelium being found in areas that are entrances into your body and areas that are exits of your body. And they have to be moist. That's an easy way to remember where you can find it. All right, stratified cuboidal epithelium. Again, it's stratified to more layers, all right, cuboidal in shape. All right, we are going to see that this type of epithelium has a protective function and, oh, there it is again, secretion. So guess what? It's going to be found in glands. And what it does is it helps to form the walls of the ducts in these types of glands. What does that mean? Well, there's two types. All right, well, we're talking about exocrine glands. Exocrine glands, there's two types of glands. And we'll talk about this next class. There's two types of glands, real quick. Exocrine glands and endocrine glands. All right, exocrine glands have ducts. Endocrine glands do not. And I'll elaborate more on that later on. So we're gonna talk about an exocrine gland. So there's two parts to the exocrine gland. This big fat part right here, that's the secretory portion. That portion is gonna make sweat, let's say. And then the sweat's gonna leave. And so that part that it's leaving through here, that little tube-like structure, that is the duct. So we are going to see this type of epithelio, epithelium, excuse me, lining these walls, these ducts here, okay? All right, and then we've got our stratified columnar epithelium. Again, we have another rare type of epithelium, all right? Because it's stratified, we're gonna see it offer protective functions. And then again, there's secretion. So we have to think of glands. And so we'll see this in the ducts of our larger salivary glands. All right, that'd be like the parotid gland. And then finally, the last type of epithelium is the transitional epithelium. That is the transforming epithelium that I was telling you about. The nice thing is about this type of epithelium, it's found in the urinary tract, so it's not found all over the body, so we can uh, focus in on it. And so when we talk about this type of epithelium, we usually talk about the urinary bladder of where it's located. And the shape of this type of this cell of this epithelium, it really depends on whether or not you have a full bladder when the bladder's stretched, or you just finished going to the bathroom and your bladder's nice and relaxed. Okay, so if you have an empty bladder, all right, the cells on the bottom layer are going to look more cuboidal or, or polyhedral. So uh, um, kind of like a, 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 not a rounded shape, but they'll have several sides to it. And the apical cells are going to be on the top and they're going to be nice and rounded. Now, when the bladder is full, the walls get stretched and everything goes flat. And these cells, have a nice distinguishing characteristic in the fact that they have not one, but two nuclei. So we refer to those as binucleated cells. And so let me zoom in on this. And so here you can see, here's an empty bladder. And so the empty bladder, the apical cells are nice and rounded, large and rounded. Here's a, a, a binucleated cell. You can see there's two nuclei inside the cell. I've right, got a couple other, here's another one, all right? <clears throat> so you can see it's by, nice and rounded here. Now, when we get to a bladder that's full, you can see everything's getting pushed to the side because the urine is pressing, so it's nice and flat. All right, that's a good place to stop as any, I would say, because we got as far as I wanted to go. So do you folks have, oh, Rachel, you had a, you had a question. Uh, off topic, uh, where will the assignments be posted? All right, great topic or, or question. I'm just gonna stop recording here real fast.